Okay, so let's go back. Um, I think we covered this slide previously, but we'll go back through it now. So we're going to talk about different social insurance programs that involve the labor market. So we have DI, which is disability insurance, which provides you insurance benefits in the case of a career-ending in, uh, injury. This is part of what we consider what we kind of colloquially call Social Security. It's actually called OASDI, which is both Social Security and disability insurance, and it's survivor benefits in Social Security. Um, in the article that was just for fun that I sent to you over Blackboard, um, it had this interesting fact, or a different article this week, um, it may have been, that one out of five Social Security dollars now is actually paying DI benefits. And one of the sleeper stories of the last 15 years has been the growing um, DI roles. More and more Americans are on DI every year, and it's actually, you know, people are trying to be concerned that we're pulling people out of the labor market, perhaps um, prematurely with DI. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So that's disability insurance. Unemployment insurance provides you insurance benefits in the case in which you become involuntarily unemployed. So you can't, you can't be fired and you can't quit. But if you become unemployed due to sort of uh, layoffs, you can apply for your unemployment benefits. And those are typically limited, but there's some extensions as well. And the last uh, labor market social insurance program we'll talk about is workers' compensation, which provides you benefits in the case of when you have an on-the-job injury. And that's sort of temporary, unlike DI. So, okay, so let's go through this really quickly. So again, the qualifying events for UI, it's unemployment, but you must also be simultaneously seeking reemployment. For DI, it's career-ending disability, and workers' comp, it's an on-the-job injury. The duration of benefits for UI is typically 26 to 65 weeks, but as many of you are aware, we're in the midst of a pretty severe recession, and benefits have been extended by the federal government several times. At this point, I think it's up to 99 weeks of benefits, which if you divide by 52, is nearly two years. Um, so we have, we have really extended unemployment benefits uh, during this recession. And typically during bad national recessions, we see the federal government coming through and kicking in um, additional, additional weeks of unemployment benefits. For DI, the duration of benefits is indefinite. Theoretically, one can be on DI and then exit DI and go back into the workforce. That is very rarely seen. It is generally an absorbing state. Once you qualify for DI benefits, you typically stay on DI benefits. Um, until you're actually of retirement age and then you go on to regular Social Security. For workers' comp, the duration of benefits is also indefinite, but it's indefinite in a much more sh short-term way. On the job injuries, these are things that happen to you that you know, lead to a temporary um, inability to work, not a permanent. If it's a permanent disability, you'd go, you would apply for DI instead. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, when we talk about moral hazard, right, we've talked about how moral hazard is more likely in situations where it's difficult to verify whether or not you've entered the adverse state, right? Whether or not you've, uh, you've, uh, the bad thing has happened to you is hard to verify. Moral hazard is more likely. How do you actually, how difficult is it to verify entry into the, into the adverse state? In the case of unemployment, it's easy, right? We can tell if someone is unemployed or not. Whether or not they're really searching for a job is more difficult to assess, right? It's more difficult to assess whether someone is actively seeking reemployment. In DI, it's somewhat difficult. In the case of some uh, career-ending injuries, it's easy to verify. You've had a severe uh, injury on the job, or in general, you've had a severe injury, and we can see test results or x-rays or MRIs and assess the extent of your in injury. In other cases, it's more difficult. We've talked a bit about that. You know, one example would be chronic pain, right, where the injury could be very real, but it's also something that's easier to, to fake, right, to pretend you've, in, you've um, entered the adverse state while you have not. So for DI, it can be somewhat difficult to assess whether or not someone has entered the state. In the case of workers' compensation, it's actually very difficult. It's very difficult to assess whether or not someone is temporarily injured enough such that they have to be temporarily off the job. Um, part of what's actually difficult to verify with workers' comp is not even the fact that they're injured, but that the fact they got injured on the job, right? Um, an individual could be injured on the weekend or injured at home and come in the next day to work and claim workers' comp, right? And that's what makes workers' comp difficult to verify. What is the actual extent of consumption smoothing benefits um, offered? Forget consumption smoothing, just how big are the benefits, right? Um, in the case of unemployment insurance, it's nearly 50% of pre-unemployment wages on average, on average across people, of course. So nearly 50%. DI is fairly generous. It's 60% of pre-injury wages. Is, the general average uh, replacement rate. Workers' comp is the most generous of all. It's nearly 90% on average um, people get in benefits uh, as a fraction of their pre-injury wages. So this is extremely annoying. Um, this is some kind of energy saving idea, and as I, generally I believe in energy saving, but this is, there's, there's a limit. 
and I, I asked if we could turn it off. We can't, so um, the screen will go dark if I don't touch the computer for like 30 seconds or something. Uh, it's really annoying. Okay. And when it comes to variation across the states, so UI is actually administered at the state level. It's a federal program. The taxes are paid. You pay a tax. Um, you know, it's part of FICA, but uh, it's actually administered at the state level. Benefits and other rules of UI actually differ across states. Um, with DI, the program is national. It's part of Social Security. But whether or not you're deemed injured enough to qualify for DI is determined by state level panels. The benefits are paid out. All that stuff is done by the federal government. But the actual determination of the extent of your injury is done by a state panel. And for workers' comp, the benefits and other rules are, done, um, are, are mandated and administered at the state level as well. OK, so let's talk about unemployment insurance. How is it financed? It's financed on, by, with a payroll tax levied on employers. The average tax rate paid by employers is 2.1%. It's not a flat tax across employers because we actually want to have some type of experience rating. We want the premiums or taxes that employers pay to vary by how many layoffs they've, sort of, um, they've made in previous years. So if you're a firm that's constantly, constantly laying off workers, you're going to pay a higher tax rate. And it's not one for one. It's not like for every layoff, your tax rate goes up by how much those benefits cost. Because we want to provide some insurance to the firms, right? Insure them against sort of negative shocks that happen to them. But at the same time, we want to have high layoff firms paying higher premiums because we don't want to trigger moral hazard. Because if we keep subsidizing layoffs, we're going to subsidize, uh, if we keep subsidizing layoffs, we're going to get more layoffs, right? So we experience rate it. And that's why the UI tax, that's why the UI tax is levied on employers and not employees. The employers pay the tax because the moral hazard we're concerned about is employers engaging in too many layoffs. So we want to assess the tax at the employer level. So there's no employee share. That doesn't mean employees don't pay the tax, right? Because what determines who pays the tax? Relative elasticity. See, that's like a fact from the first half you can't forget, right? Yeah, exactly. OK, so to be eligible for UI, you must have actually earned a minimum amount of income in the prior year. That minimum is set by states. You must have been laid off and not fired or quit. And you must be actively seeking work. You basically have to show evidence that you're trying to be reemployed. The benefits vary by state. And as we said, the average replacement rate is 47%. Benefits typically last for 26 weeks, so roughly half a year. But they get automatically ex extended by a quarter of a year, by 13 weeks, whenever a state's unemployment rate reaches a certain uh, threshold. The federal government will often come in during bad recessions and extend benefits even further, like we see now. So like all insurance, right? insurance has the benefit of offering insurees the opportunity to, to smooth consumption. But there's always a cost to insurance, right? and that's the changes in behavior we trigger by just insuring people, what we call moral hazard. So this is a chart of the hazard rate. This is a hazard rate tells us, given you have not experienced exit in this case, right? you're not experienced the event yet, what's the probability you experience the event now? That's what a hazard rate tells us. So if you had a hazard rate for, say, uh, fertility, it would say, you know, if you've not had a kid yet, what's the probability you have a kid at this age? That would be the ha fa fertility, hazard, fertility hazard rate. Here we're looking at a hazard rate for exit from unemployment. So this is plotting, given that you have not yet exited from unemployment, what is the probability you exit from unemployment now? So what we have on the x-axis is weeks of work. So at one week, you have, you know, roughly 5%. At five weeks, it's sort of bouncing around, right? 15 weeks, it's getting a little higher, but then it kind of comes down at 20 weeks. Boom, where do we see the spike? 26 weeks. You're suddenly much more likely to exit from unemployment at 26 weeks. OK, this could be a natural artifact of the labor market, but it's hard to really come up with a story behind that, right? This graph, this moral hazard chart, I mean, this, uh, this uh, hazard rate chart, really suggests that the fact that unemployment runs out at 26 weeks leads people to suddenly search for work or become reemployed at 26 weeks. It could be the fact that people don't look very hard in the beginning, right? And they look harder later. Or it could be that they actually kind of know where they're going to work, and they just wait for 26 weeks to actually be reemployed. But whatever the actual sort of mechanism is, this chart does make us suspect that there is a quite a bit of moral hazard in unemployment insurance. 
But then again, you know, I do want to, so here. Uh, okay. yes. So there's one more point I want to say. So do we want people necessarily getting reemployed at one week of unemployment? No, right? Because what we're, one of the things we're trying to do with unemployment benefits is help people find equally productive jobs, right? This is the story of we don't want a heart <coughs> surgeon finding employment after one week of unemployment as a mechanic, right? It's because his skills are a better match for a different job. One of the things we're sub, so when we provide unemployment insurance, we're allowing people to smooth consumption such that they can find employment in a job best suited for their skills, so they can redeploy their skills as productively as possible. So there's a trade-off, right? We don't want people, this looks like there's a lot of moral hazard, but we also don't want to force people into reemployment in a less than productive occupation. Okay, so we've done some studies. This is a paper by uh, Bruce Meyer in the late 80s that looks at sort of what happens to uh, UI duration, so how long people are on un unemployment insurance, as a function of the generosity of benefits. And what he finds is that, so he compares two states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, right next to each other. Philadelphia is kind of a city of both states in some ways, right? So these are pretty similar comparable states. And he finds that a 10% increase in UI benefits in New Jersey relative to Pennsylvania led to an 8% increase in the duration of unemployment spells. So, you know, if somehow P Pennsylvania and New Jersey are not as comparable as we think, this could be biased. But, you know, this sort of pretty clean variation leads us to believe that there is quite a bit of moral hazard when it comes to unemployment. So this is a study of um, looking at experience rating and layoffs. So this is a graph that sort of tells us that there is experience rating, but it's not one for one, right? At really high um, levels of, of, of uh, layoffs, your tax rate does not go up one for one anymore. This is just to show you that, you know, when we actually graph, um, when we actually think about how we do experience rating, it's different by state. But so basically, you know, we start sort of increasing taxes for each layoff initially, but if you're a really high layoff firm, we stop sort of increasing your premiums or your taxes as much. And that's because we want to actually insure firms against really bad shocks, right? And that's the idea of not having one for one experience rating. Because what, we, you know, what we're trying to avoid is firms that use UI to basically partially compensate their employees for having seasonal employment. You can imagine seasonal industries like um, construction or holiday type things could basically rely on UI every year to sort of retain a workforce, right? And that's the kind of thing we're trying to discourage by having experience rating in the insurance, in the, insurance, um, in the uh, tax rate of levied on employers. So that's UI. Now let's move on to DI. So DI is part of what we call OASDI, Old Age Security and Disability Insurance. It's Social Security wedded with disability insurance. It's financed as part of your FICA, right? It's 1.8% of payroll is DI. Eligibility is determined at, the, at a state by state level. There's a state panel of doctors and social workers and experts in each state that look at cases when you apply for DI and determine whether or not you're eligible. So that's done by the states. But it's federally run, right? The benefits and all that is paid out by the, uh, by the federal government. And there's always a five month waiting period between sort of when you are qualified and when your benefits start. So that's one sort of gap in the consumption smoothing we offer. And I, I think, as I've mentioned before, you also, after two years, are eligible for Medicare. But in addition to the five-month wait to get benefits, there's a two-year wait to be on Medicare, which is, um, so if you've had a career-ending injury, you have to seek medical care through either insurance from your employer that sort of remains with you or other sources, perhaps Medicaid or something. But yeah, Medicare doesn't kick in for two years. The benefits um, are such that if a worker is deemed to be disabled enough to qualify for, GI, for DI, they get their social security benefits at the age of disability. So whatever their benefits would have been at the normal retirement age, the PIA, the primary insurance amount, they'll go ahead and get at their time of injury. So thus the average uh, replacement rate is fairly high, it's 60%. And that's partly because those who go on to DI are not really the top of the income distribution, right? They're sort of in the middle. So the fact that, you know, we've talked about how social security benefits are sort of a concave function of what you used to earn. The replacement rate is really high for people who are low to moderate income, right, for high income people because of the cap on, you know, on benefits. The benefit replacement ratio of Social Security is not very high for very high income folks. For similar reasons, um, because those who actually go on to DI tend to be lower moderate income people, the replacement rate is higher than the average Social Security replacement rate. Does that make sense? Okay. So DI is a big concern. It's a big concern because of how many people seem to be going on to DI. 
So this is time series evidence, so you should all be kind of squinting at me skeptically, but I'm still going to give it to you. So the red line plots the percent of men between the ages of 45 and 54 who are not participating in the labor force, who aren't working and aren't seeking work. So you can see since 1950, it's taken a sharp rise, rising particularly quickly from the mid-60s um, up until the 80s. The green line is the percent of men in that same age range, 45 to 54, that are on DI, that are receiving disability benefits. As you can see, when we see DI growing sharply, it's exactly when we see men of that age group falling out of the labor force. And this is a concern, right? This is a good thing if those men are, are, you know, were experiencing injuries that previously they couldn't actually get, you know, be insured against, and so they're now able to stop working because they're hurt. It's moral hazard if you know, we're pulling people out of the labor force who otherwise should be working, right? That's the question. Okay, right, but so I think what we generally think about how the U.S. economy has changed from 1950 is towards um, fewer manual labor type jobs. So if we look at U.S. manufacturing, it's far more capital intensive, i.e. robots build stuff more than ever before. Uh, that makes me sound silly, but I mean, I actually made it robots build stuff. Um, so I think that's a story. It's a story that maybe there was a bigger sort of um, unskilled, uh, a, a larger sector of the economy required unskilled labor previously, and there was other job opportunities within it. It's, you know, I need to see a lot more evidence on it, because given what I generally think of how work has changed in the US. But that could be part of it. It could be that um, those who sort of remain in low and moderate skilled jobs, like they, um, face you know, greater sort of, um, their outside opportunities have shrunk just because that part of labor demand has shrunk, right? So it, that's more, that could be moral hazard, right? They're, they're unable to find sort of their out, you know, this is another version of what you said, but sort of like their next best option is much weaker, and so they'd rather go on DI. And that's, we, that's one of the things we worry about. It's a big concern. I mean, there's an article in New York Times, you know, it's, sometimes there's this funny feeling as an economist that things we were talking about four years ago and we all worried intensively about and we still worry about, a few years later the New York Times discovers it, right? This is like income inequality, this is uh, stuff like that, and uh, this is one of them. And DI has been a concern among labor economists for, for many years now. And it's interesting that now it's getting national attention. Because one in five Social Security dollars, right? That's a huge fraction of Social Security that's being paid out as part of a program that I don't know, how many of you have heard of, had heard of DI before you took public finance? Okay, so you'd all heard of it. Um, but I think it's not as well known a program as maybe general social security is. And when people think about the social security pro, uh, financial problems of social security, they may not be remembering that DI is part of it too. But you all also are public service, Wagner public school public service students, you're probably selected into knowing about DI. But I think most people are less informed about it. Okay, now let's talk about workers' comp. So workers' comp, again, is about uh, on-the-job injuries and insurance against entering that adverse state. So worker behavior well, that could be affected. Oh, sorry, did we skip? Yeah, we've skipped lots of stuff. So workers' compensation is, is a state mandate that employers have to buy what's known as no-fault insurance against on-the-job accidents. The no-fault is key because we don't want this to be sort of tied up in the court system. So if you slip at work and you hurt your back, there could be some question as to did you spill a soda and then slip at work and hurt your back and that's somehow your fault or was the floor wet and thus you slipped? That's what the no fault gets us out of. They're not going to determine whose fault it is. You got hurt on the job. It's just the fact you got hurt on the job. You're automatically insured um, any, any loss of, of, of wages because you can't work during that time. The benefits vary by state, but they consist of the following. Medical coverage. So your medical, medical care related to that injury is covered. Unlike DI, you know, where there's that two-year waiting period. So the medical coverage is, is covered. And there's also cash payments to compensate for your lost wages. The replacement rate on average is 67%. So if we take the benefits you receive and divide by your pre-tax salary, or by your pre-injury salary, the ratio is generally 67%. But we're actually going to call that 89%. Because what we're talking about is your workers' compensation benefits divided by your pre-injury wages, right? Your wages would have been taxed as regular income. Your workers' compensation benefits are actually exempted from taxation at the federal level. And so it's really like an 89% replacement rate because the ratio of your benefits to your after-tax pre-injury wages is roughly 90%. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. So we worry about moral hazard in all social insurance programs, including workers' comp. So what kinds of moral hazard are we worried about? How are we afraid we're affecting worker behavior? 
Well, the, for, the sort of the source of moral hazard could be reporting, right? You pretend you're injured when you're not. You pretend to have had an on-the-job injury when it was really a weekend basketball injury, right? That's reporting. There's the duration. So if you're injured on the job, you may have stayed off of stayed home from work for a couple days if you weren't insured. But given that you have workers' compensation, you maybe extend your time away from work from two days to a week. Right? The duration of your time away from work may be affected by the fact you're insured. The types of injuries reported could be, could be affected. And if you hurt your thumb, you may not have actually stayed home from work if you weren't insured. But if, now that you are insured, you decide to go ahead and take workers' comp. And the one-day effect is sort of what I, what I threw in under reporting. You get hurt over the weekend. You wait until Monday, two hours into your shift. You say that you, know, you were hurt on the job. You hurt your back on the job. That's the Monday effect. What do we worry about when it comes to workers' compensation and firms? Well, experience rating is only partial for workers' comp, too. And so you could imagine if a, if a firm faced the full marginal cost of their workers getting injured on the job, they might put in place better workplace sh safety. Right? They might actually sort of avoid worker injuries to a greater extent if they face the full marginal cost of their workers getting injured. The fact that they're part of this risk pool and some of the cost of injuries are shared by other insurees makes them less likely to maybe fully protect their workers against injuries. OK, so what, is we, what do we know from research? So Alan Kruger in 1991 wrote this paper where he looked at the fact that in Minnesota, Workers' comp benefits were increased by roughly 10%. And he found that it led to a 17% increase in the duration of injuries on average. And that most of that increase in injury duration was driven by what we would say are hard to verify injuries. Things like back sprains were, was, were the driver of that increase in injury duration. And so there seems to be quite a bit of evidence about severe moral hazard when it comes to workers' comp. Um, this is a quote about workers' comp in New York. I'm going to let you read it on your own. Um, everyone's literate, so you guys can do that. Um, it's sort of my effort to make it relevant to your life. Um, it's in, about New York State workers' comp. OK, so I just want to go through one last piece, and then we'll move on to Lecture 13. So when we think about optimal social insurance when it comes to these labor market-based programs, there are some implications, right? First of all, when we think about benefit, ger benefit generosity, we want a replacement rate that's less than 100%, right? Because we want to offer individuals consumption smoothing benefits, but we've seen that there is evidence of moral hazard in all of these programs, right? There's some concern about moral hazard in all of them, and so we know the replacement rate should surely be less than 100%. The moral hazard, from what we know from empirical studies, what we know is the moral hazard is worst for workers' comp, and then comes unemployment insurance, and the least moral hazard is DI. From what, this is what we know from empirical studies. This is a combination of good research and our inability to find things, right? Both of those things are part of this. But given that we have that general sense that workers' comp has the worst moral hazard, then comes UI, and then comes DI, it actually seems like our benefit gener generosity is backwards, right? Because which one of these three has the highest replacement rate? Workers' comp. Then comes DI. Oh, sorry, then comes, uh, then comes uh, DI, and then comes unemployment insurance. But it seems like we're giving the highest replacement rate to the, to the uh, social insurance program that we figure has the worst moral hazard, which is workers' comp. Um, Strauss. So if you experience like a career-ending uh, injury at work, yes. so does workers' comp kind of stay throughout your, you never get on to DI? Or you stay no, you'll, you'll be treated for workers' comp, and then you're going to apply for DI to, for your permanent benefits. OK, so workers' comp is not going to be a temp a permanent benefit. They'll probably cover a lot of the medical care that you need. but. Um, I'd have to check the state. I think it varies by state what, if there's a cap on the medical care or what happened, how long it can last. So you wouldn't get like 89% of that? Not forever. forever, no. No, I think there's a limit. I mean, I'd have to look up the details. It's a good question as to how people transition from workplace-based career-ending injuries to, to, um, to DI. I would also guess if you have a career-ending injury on the job, yeah, I think you don't just rely on workers' comp. I think you actually, you know, you have your no-fault insurance that covers you right away. But I think you're also going to look for fault-based compensation in that case. But um, I, I'll, uh, that's a good question, though, for a case that it is sort of, you know, what do you do if you're injured in a severe way on the job? Because, you know, things like that happen, right? I mean, there are some very, very dangerous jobs in America, like rig work would be an example of that, um, slaughterhouses, places like that. Um, and you can imagine there being very severe injuries on the job. Does anyone need a handout? People can, I mean, sometimes, sometimes some of you will come up to me after class and say, oh, can I get a handout? I wonder, you know, it's okay to interrupt me for a handout. Everyone have one? Okay. 
Okay, excellent. So targeting. We want to target these programs at those who will benefit most from the consumption smoothing and or those who have the smallest moral hazard problems. So when we think about people who would benefit most from the consumption smoothing these programs offer, we mean people who are sort of liquidity constraint. They can't smooth through private saving because maybe they don't have enough income or they can't access capital markets for some reason, right? Those are the folks we worry about when it comes to offering them insurance to help them with consumption smoothing. So that's a reason to not have high replacement rates for really high income workers, right? Because they can probably self-insure to some degree. Um, when it comes to moral hazard, you know, we do want to maybe target benefits to more verifiable injuries, right? And so sometimes you, you hear discussions of um, the mental health parity, and that's a big issue, right, for those for individuals who, who face mental health difficulties. But the economics of it kind of puts mental health difficulties sometimes in the same category as back sprains, right? That they're harder to verify. And so the optimal social insurance against those kinds of, those kinds of illnesses is sort of complicated, right? It's complicated. And sort of the other end of equity, right? There's equity, which is about treating people who are equally injured the same. And then we worry about efficiency. And where you fall on that continuum has a lot to do with, you know, your values and your efficiency and you know, how you feel about efficiency. But that's sort of the trade-off with some of these things. Um, with experience rating, the fact that we only partially experience rate firms does lead them to have more layoffs and longer durations and more claims and all this stuff. But we also want to sort of um, protect firms against bad states. At the same time, we don't need to consumption smooth. We don't have to offer firms consumption smoothing in the same way that we have to offer individuals because businesses typically have better access to capital markets, right? And they can smooth through lending, and bar through, borrowing, um, through borrowing through capital markets. And then finally, um, there are some initiatives to go ahead and help you know, replace our existing social insurance programs that are sort of insurance, right, with individual privately, private, private consumption smoothing. So basically uh, turning social insurance programs into social insurance savings accounts that are at the individual level. There's been some ideas about taking social security and making it private accounts, right? And there's been some talk of doing the same with UI. That instead of offering you benefits for each week you're unemployed, we give you an account worth $15,000. You can spend it as you wish. If you are re-employed in two weeks, the rest of that money is yours to keep. Right? So we have, this, we have provided people with an incentive to get re-employed faster. But there's some worries about that too because, you know, we're going to end up paying full, you know, higher benefits to everyone to some degree, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't be saving money on the folks who do get re-employed faster. And second, we worry a little bit paternalistically as well, right? That if we hand people a bank account worth $50,000 the week they're unemployed, what if they don't smooth correctly in six weeks? They're still unemployed, but the money has run out, right? Are we going to then provide them additional benefits, right? Or are we just going to leave, or, or are we not? And it's hard to commit to not providing them uh, additional benefits. So that's part of it, too. OK, so that's the end of lecture 11. Now we're going to move on to lecture, like a flavor of the EITC. We've talked about some, uh, some of these budget constraints before. But yes, budget constraints are back. They're going to be part of your life today, and they'll be back on Wednesday. We're going to talk about state and local public finance. We're going to talk about the budgets of governments, of municipalities and local governments. So yes, budget constraints, back and better than ever. OK, so when we talk about welfare, what are we talking about? We're talking about redistributive policies, policies that are geared towards providing uh, income to those who have low levels of income. When we have transfers, we often trigger moral hazard. And we're going to talk about mechanisms or ways through which we can try to reduce the moral hazard problems. Then we're finally going to talk about measurements of poverty. Right? When we're talking about redistribution, we're talking about transferring income to those who are poor. But what does poor mean? Right? And what maybe we have some current measures, there's some alternative measures, and we'll talk about what they do in terms of who is poor. Because one of the issues, oh, we'll talk about it at the end. OK, so redistribution policies. Why does redistribution have the potential for increasing social welfare? OK, let's take a particular social welfare function. Let's say we're utilitarians. Utilitarians means we add up everyone's utility. We weight everyone the same. So we have, let's say we only have two people in society. We have a guy who has $100,000 in income, and we have a guy who has $10,000 in income. We're utilitarians, and both of these characters have diminishing marginal utility. Suppose we take a dollar of income from the guy making 100 grand and give it to the guy making 10 grand. The guy making 100 grand is going to have less utility now, right? But the decrease in his utility is going to be smaller than the increase in the 10 grand guy's utility, right? And that's because of what? DMU, diminishing marginal utility, exactly. The guy who has a lot of income 
doesn't get, he gets happier from additional income, but not as much as a guy who has a lot less income. So it's sort of like we're arbitraging utility in a way, right? We're taking from a guy whose marginal utility is low and giving to a guy who has, marginal, who has a much higher marginal utility. So total utility in society goes up. That's the source of sort of social welfare improvement via redistribution. Why can't we do this to the private market? There is private charity, right? People give money to charity. People give money to the poor. People do it uh, directly, right? Uh, if you hand money to a panhandler, that's charity, right? It's transferring income, perhaps, from you, who someone has a lower um, marginal utility of income than the person you're handing it to. People give money to their churches, who then support um, programs for the poor. There are privately run soup kitchens. Big foundations give money to, to organizations that help low income families and individuals. There's a lot of private charity, right? But why is that not quite enough? Well, you know, it's the same free rider problem we've talked about before, right? It's the tragedy of public goods in a sense. That I like the notion that no one in New York City is going to sleep outside when it's cold, right? I get utility from that being true. But when I think about how much money to give to homeless shelter charities, I think about how much utility I get from the fact that no one's going to sleep outside when it's cold. I don't think about the, the utility that all of you would get from it too, right? It's the public goods issue. It's the free rider issue. So that the socially optimal level of contribution to redistribution will be, below, will be above what the private market will do itself. Right? There's just going to be under provision of redistribution through the private market. And that's where the government sort of steps in. Because the level of redistribution will be suboptimal due to the public goods nature or the free rider problem of redistribution, the government can help come in and actually increase redistribution to the socially optimal level. But when we redistribute, it's not dollar for dollar, right? We can't really take a dollar from one person and give it to another without losing anything else. And one sort of analogy, one way to explain this is there's this man, Arthur Oaken. He did a lot of economics work. He's a very famous economist. He had this analogy of when we're redistributing, it's like we're trying to move water from point A to point B using a leaky bucket. As I try to move a gallon of water, by the time I get it to point B, it's going to be less than a gallon. I've moved, I've taken a gallon from point A, but I'm going to arrive at point B with less than a gallon because of those leaks. What are those leaks? Well, there's dead weight loss first. When I try to take a dollar from the guy who's making $100,000 a year, right, the fact that I'm taxing him is going to make him less inclined to supply labor, right? There's dead weight loss from the taxation required to engage in redistribution. So that's our first leak. The rich have less incentive to work or save because of taxes. The second source of leakiness is moral hazard. When we redistribute, when we give people income, they have less incentive to work. We call that the income effect, right? It could also be a substitution effect, depending on the program. But we weaken the incentives for the individual receiving transfers to work. Right? That's the moral hazard. And finally, there's the administrative cost of just running these programs, which, you know, as a share of benefits may not be large, but as a total amount of money is non-trivial. And those are our leaks, right? That's why we can't move a gallon from point A to point B, is that some of the water leaks out through dead weight loss, through moral hazard, and through administrative costs. So we have many programs in the US to alleviate poverty. We have wage subsidies, right? We have ways in which the federal government actually, and in state governments too, actually increase the wage low-income workers earn, namely the EITC, which we've talked about before. We have commodity subsidies. We don't do this much in the US, but in foreign countries, they do a lot more of this, where sort of rice is subsidized in some countries, or wheat is subsidized. People don't pay market prices. They pay something much less than that as a form of sort of income support or sort of um, subsistence support for poor families. It's kind of a blunt instrument, right? Because what, what countries that use commodity subsidies often end up doing is they end up subsidizing that commodity for everyone, even those who don't necessarily need the transfer, right? And so if you're really trying to help the very low income, you're spending a lot of money on folks who are not poor if you use commodity subsidies. And if you try to create a system where, oh, you have to show your you know, poverty card in order to get the lower price, that's going to lead to corruption too, right? The kind of countries that typically engage in commodity subsidy, subsidy um, 
often don't have the administrative efficiency to really run these programs very well. And that's part of the reason why they use such a blunt instrument, right? They have trouble running a system like the EITC. So they use this blunt instrument, but it is very expensive. It's a very expensive way to engage in transfers. And then we have what we do in the US, which is a means-tested transfer program, where if you are poor enough, you're eligible for cash income benefits or in-kind benefits from the federal or state government. The means tested is a if you're poor enough part. OK, so what are our means tested transfer programs in the US? Well, there's Medicaid, which is health care for, for poor people, and the near poor in some cases. right? We talked about that on Wednesday, that children and pregnant women in particular can often be Medicaid eligible, even if they're not below the federal poverty level. There's public housing, which is both the direct provision of housing, like housing projects is what we often call them, and Section 8 vouchers, which allow, which you know, a family can take to a landlord that's a private landlord and use to offset part of their rent. So we provide housing. We have what's called SNAP now, which is commonly referred to as food stamps. So there's no longer paper food stamps. You get a debit card um, to use in grocery stores um, and food vouchers uh, for the low income. So there's, there's sort of, uh, sort of uh, food-based uh, support. That sort of debit cards and vouchers you take to the grocery store. There's also something known as WIC, right, which is for women, infants, and children, which is often the direct provision of groceries. And we also have uh, reduced and free lunch programs for children in public schools. And we, all, we have SSI, which is um, social supplemental insurance, which is sort of for workers who, or no, for, for, for the elderly who'd never worked enough to qualify for social security, in part. Um, it's also cash welfare for the blind or disabled who didn't pay into the, SS, the social security system enough to get DI benefits, for example. They could be on SSI. And then we have TANF, which will be what we talk a lot about today, the temporary assistance to needy families. We've talked before about how TANF came about as part of the 1996 welfare reform initiative, which took what had been known as AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, and transformed it into TANF. There were a lot of changes in the structure of the program. Namely, one of the, one of the really salient ones is that there's a lifetime limit on how, how many years you can receive cash welfare benefits now. It's roughly five years. There's some, there's some uh, exceptions to the rule. You can have waivers for some groups. But generally, there's a lifetime limit on how long you can receive welfare now. Um, and TANF is the program we have in place to, today. So TANF primarily provides cash benefits to single mothers, typically, because uh, we, it's single mothers for two reasons. We basically provide larger benefits to families with children, right, because we're trying to support children. And you have to be very low income. And if you're a married couple, you typically have enough income that takes you out of that category. So that's why it's single mothers. It could be single fathers, right? Just a, an, an individual wor working or not working with children. But that's just a less common family structure. There's nothing about being a woman, really, here. It's about having children and being low income that makes single women the target, single mothers the target of this program. So how, does this, how do these programs basically work? So we've talked a bit about this stuff before, but just, just to review. The basic structure is your cash benefit is some amount B, where B is the difference of your benefit guarantee, which is the biggest your benefit can possibly be, less the product of your earnings, which is wages times hours worked, W times H, times the benefit reduction rate tau. Right? So WH is income, basically. It's wages times hours worked, wage times hours worked, hourly wage times hours worked. And then tau is your benefit reduction rate. So the way to think about this is suppose your maximum benefit was $1,000. That would be G. And your benefits are reduced 50 cents for every dollar you earn. right? So for each dollar you earn, you lose 50 cents of benefits. The dollar you earn is W times H. right? And the tax rate is 0.5. So the break-even point is where you no longer receive benefits. right? That's going to be where B equals 0. Right? In other words, where G equals tau times W times H. So the way to calculate that, right? You, if, I want to, if you want to tell me the income level at which you no longer receive benefits, you're going to take B and divide by tau, the benefit reduction rate. Right? And that will give you the level of income. If you then need to know the number of hours worked, you divide by W, the wage rate. Anyone want me to say it again? Yes. OK, so your break-even point, which is the point at which you're no longer receiving benefits, i.e., b equals 0. Let's look at this equation, b equals 0. That'll be where g equals tau times w times h, right? So if you need to know how much income you need to earn 
so that you're no longer receiving benefits, what you're solving for is W times H, right? That's what income is. So you're going to take B and divide by T, or tau, the tax rate, the benefit reduction rate. So that's a situation, like suppose I tell you your maximum benefit is $1,000, your benefit reduction rate is 50%. If I ask you what your break-even point is in terms of income, you would take $1,000, divide by 0.5, and you would know that you no longer qualify for benefits once you've reached $2,000 uh, $2, of income. Right? Because if you have $2,000 of income, you multiply that by your benefit reduction rate of 50%. So how much of benefits have you lost if you have $2,000 of income? You've lost 1,000. The maximum benefit is 1,000, so you've, you've you, you're no longer eligible for the program. All right. So you know it's $1,000 of income. Suppose I then ask you how many hours you need to work to reach that break-even point. You would divide 1,000 by your hourly wage to get the number of hours you need to work. It all comes from this simple equation. OK, so let's do a simple example. This is all, it's all coming back now, right, the budget constraints. Oh, yeah. So our blue line is our original budget constraint. This individual, because remember, we, what do we plot on the x-axis? Hours of leisure, good stuff. And on our y-axis, we're just going to put dollars of consumption per year. So initially, this worker you know, earns two, $10 an hour. So they could either spend their 2,000 hours available entirely in leisure. They'd be at this intercept down here. Or they could work every hour, and they'd earn $20,000 in income. This person is clearly a low-income individual. So they're potentially eligible for this program. Suppose the benefit we can offer them is $9,000, right? That's where that, uh, let's call that violet line is located, right? $9,000. And this is an example where, gee, the maximum benefit is $9,000, but you lose a dollar of benefits for every dollar you earn. So initially, let's say she wasn't working at all. What's her benefit going to be? $9,000. What's her total consumption? available to her going to be? $9,000. Let's say she goes ahead, she uh, decides to work for an hour. How much is she earning if her wage rate is $10 an hour? $10. So she has a $9,000 benefit. She's earning $10. But with a 100% benefit reduction rate, how much in benefits is she losing? $10. So what is her total consumption available to her? The same $9,000. That's why this is a flat line. Because even as she decides to work, she's not actually expanding her consumption set. Because for every dollar she earns, she's losing a dollar of, of TANF benefits, of welfare benefits. So she's sort of working with really no benefit here until she reaches the point where she loses all benefits, right? What, let's figure out what number that's going to be. So what's her maximum benefit again? 9,000. So our break-even level of income is going to be 9,000 divided by 100%, also known as 1. So when has she exhausted her benefits after how much income? $9,000. How much does she earn per hour? So after 900 hours of work. This is leisure, so we're going to subtract 900 from 2,000 and get to 1,100. That's when she's exhausted her benefits, and she's now a non-eligible worker who simply faces her regular budget constraint from that point. Is there a question in the back? If you have a question, I'm sure someone else has it. So, nine thousand divided by 100, which is one, right? Nine thousand divided by 100 is one, and that's so that's nine thousand. Okay, that's and then wait, and then so that's how much income she has to earn for to be no longer eligible for welfare. Okay. But we know she earns income at ten dollars an hour, so that requires nine hundred hours of labor. So that break-even point is going to be at 900 hours of working or 1,100 hours of leisure. It's totally fine. If you, uh, you know, we haven't done budget constraints in a while, so if you have questions, please ask them, because I, I can assure you um, other people have them too. I skipped one. OK, so like always, these programs typically have two effects, a substitution effect because the benefit reduction rate reduces the return to working for an individual, right? Here, in fact, there is no point to working for this woman until she reaches $9,000 of income, right? Because she gets nothing for it. The tax rate's 100%. The substitution effect 
makes the return to working lower, i.e. the opportunity cost of leisure goes up, right? You'd rather be enjoying leisure. The income effect, you're transferring money to an individual. That's going to trigger an income effect. They're going to feel richer. They're want, going to want to consume more of all goods, including leisure. So this program reduces labor supply severely, right? Because suppose this, this individual had been at this point. They'd been working a few hours. They'd been working maybe 400 hours. Is there any reason for them to work? They get nothing for it, right? They could get the same amount of consumption, enjoying a lot more leisure, right? So they're going to go not here. There's no reason for them to go vertically up and work the same number of hours and get the same. They're going to go all the way over here. So the income and substitution effect here work to dissuade this individual from working. You can see the substitution effect. I know this looks a little funny because we basically put in a horizontal line, right? But the way, remember, the way we think about this is income effect means the new budget constraint lies above the old one, right? This person's richer. There's an income effect that makes them feel wealthier. They don't want to buy more of everything, including leisure. We can see the substitution effect is, is this slope different than this slope? It's a weird slope, but it's different. And is it flatter or steeper? It's, it's as flat as it can be. So there's a substitution effect that's making leisure, uh, the opportunity cost of leisure higher. We'll do another one that looks a little bit more familiar. OK, so we're going to talk about another one in just a second. But first, let's talk about, so, so we've said this kind of cash welfare program with 100% benefit. Oh, Lucas, did you have a question? No, OK, sorry. Did someone have a question up front? Michael, did you have a question? Okay. Um, so this welfare program has really bad effect on labor supply. Right, because it makes it pointless to work anywhere between, and nine, between zero and 900 hours. Right? There's no point to working any amount of time between zero and 900 hours. You can get the exact same amount of income without working at all. So this is a really bad welfare program when it comes to labor supply. This is how welfare used to look. This is how it used to work, work like in the 80s even. Right? But now let's come up, let's think about a list of potential ways we could reduce the moral hazard of this welfare program. Because that reduction in labor supply is moral hazard, right? It's a, it's a virtue of being insured against being low income. We're triggering behavior that is, that is moral hazard. OK, what could we do to reduce the moral hazard? Well, let's think about just a list of stuff we could do. Well, we could cut down on G, right? We could reduce the benefit guarantee. Could we maybe reduce the benefit reduction rate? The question mark tells you that that's going to be more complicated than it looks. So that's going to be a, a less. That's not actually going to be a good option in some ways. We'll talk about. We'll go through it very carefully in a minute. We could delink cash assistance from other programs. We've talked about Medicaid before, right? We could delink in-kind benefits from um, welfare qualification. We could target benefits to the truly needy. We could create ordeal mechanisms, and we could increase outside options. We're going to talk about all of these now, each of these in turn. So look at the first one. What would happen if we reduced the benefit guarantee? What effect would we have on moral hazard? So we keep the same basic design, right? This is our violet line. This is what we used to have before. What if we reduce the benefit guarantee? We cut it from $9,000 to say, uh, let's say $5,000. What's that going to do? Bring down the flat part of the budget constraint, right? So what has happened when you go from the purple line to the green line? All of these folks in this range are no longer welfare eligible. They're not going to have their labor supply affected by the existence of the welfare program. Right? So we strengthen labor supply incentives for everyone from here to here. Does everyone see that? Because they're just no longer part of the program. Right. Of course, what we've also done is reduce the scope of redistribution. Right? We're redistribute, we, we are redistributing to fewer people, and we're giving them less income. So when you reduce the benefit guarantee, for welfare recipients, cutting the benefit guarantee will reduce the income effect. The recipient must work more to reach any given income target. For, so for person B, so for a person who's in the range B, there's an income effect. There's also a substitution effect, right? Because their slope goes from this slope to this slope. Is their slope steeper now? Leisure is more expensive. They're going to want to work more for substitution effects, too. Everyone's going to get an income effect. Those guys have a substitution effect. For those with really strong preferences towards leisure, however, so guys in this range, they're going to feel poor, but they're not going to necessarily work because they don't like consumption enough to work. 
Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to affect the guys who are from the end of the green line to the end of the purple line, whose slope has really changed. That's where the substitution effect is going to kick in. Everyone's going to be poorer, though. OK, so that's cutting the benefit guarantee. That's cutting G. Now let's talk about what happens if we cut tau, cut the benefit reduction rate. So we would describe cutting the benefit reduction rate as letting those on welfare keep more of each dollar they earn while on welfare. Right? That's the way we describe reducing the benefit reduction rate. Because we think of the benefit reduction rate as a tax, in effect. Right? It makes the return to working lower. So you, know, you could see it being a very tempting idea. Let's increase the returns to working for people on welfare, and hopefully that'll help them work more. Right? That would be the idea. OK, let's see what happens. So we have our original welfare program. We're losing a dollar of benefits for each dollar you earn. That's our violet line. right? Then some politician comes in. They say, you know, I'm reform-minded. I want to strengthen the work incentives of welfare. Let's cut that benefit reduction rate. Let's reduce it from a dollar to 75 cents. So for each, each dollar you earn, you actually get 25 cents of more consumption now. So you earn a dollar, you're going to lose 75 cents of benefits, but you have on net a quarter more for consumption. What's that going to look like? Well, we know that this is what the original program looks like with a dollar for dollar loss. This is how the reform welfare system is going to look. Because for each hour this individual works, where they earn $10 an hour, how much more consumption will they get? $2.50. So we know their consumption is going to increase by $2.50 for each dollar they earn until the point where they're no longer welfare eligible, at which point each hour they work gives them $10 of additional consumption. That's this point. So let's figure out what this is going to be. Let's do the math. What is their maximum benefit? $9,000. So. so we're going to divide 9000 by 0.75. That's going to give us the amount of income they have to earn to no longer be welfare eligible. So 9 divided by 3 quarters, 9,000 divided by 3 quarters, is like 9 times 4 divided by 3, right? also known as $12,000. So once they've earned $12,000, they're no longer welfare eligible. We know this person earns income at $10 an hour. So $12,000 of income translates into 1,200 hours of labor. And so we know the break-even point is going to be at 800 hours of leisure. I'm just going to pause for a second. OK, so that's our new diagram. So let's think about what effects that's going to have. OK, so for those already on welfare, let's say a person in range A, right? The slower phase out, so if you were in here, let's think about it. Is there an income effect when you switch the program? Because the new budget constraint lies above the original one. You're richer, so you're going to want to work less. What else is true, though? Has the slope of your budget constraint changed? It's now steeper, which is going to lead you to want to work more. So for folks who were already on welfare, the net effect is ambiguous. Let's think about the other category. Here, write that down. I'll give you a minute. OK, let's think about the other group of people. Oh, yeah, Siobhan, go ahead. You said that the income effect, you would work more because. You'd work less. Work less because now you're more. You're richer. Exactly. Oh, okay. And so, yeah. substitution effect, work, work more. more. Because you more. Okay. Bingo, yes. Exactly. You've got it. Yes. Perfect. OK, now let's think about our other group of people. Because what has happened? When we reduced the benefit reduction rate, it became true that high, at higher levels of income, you were still, you're now eligible for welfare, right? In fact, it used to be once you earn $9,000 of income, you were no longer welfare eligible. Now, because we're taking away benefits at a slower rate, a whole new group of people 
are welfare eligible. Because we said up to $12,000 of income, you're welfare eligible. So someone who earns between $9,000 and $12,000 used to not be welfare eligible and now is. Because when we reduce the benefit reduction rate, when we cut the benefit reduction rate, we're expanding the interval of income over which you're welfare eligible. Right? It used to be 0 to 9, now it's 0 to 12. Let's think about what happens in the incentives for these folks, these folks who are newly welfare eligible. Are they richer now? Yeah. The income effect, they're getting a transfer, they're richer, makes them want to consume more of all goods, including leisure, and thus work less. What's happened to the slope of their budget constraint? Is the red line steeper or flatter than the blue line? Flatter. So the opportunity cost of leisure is gone, so they're going to want to work. So for the newly eligible population, it's unambiguously true that being newly eligible for welfare makes them less like, makes them want to work less. Makes them want to work less. So when we cut the benefit reduction rate, we have an ambiguous effect on the labor supply of those who used to be on welfare, and we have a clear negative effect on the labor supply of those who are newly eligible. So something that seemed so rhetorically attractive, right? It sounded so attractive when I told you, we're going to help people you know, who are on welfare supply more labor to the market by strengthening the incentives to work. We're going to make work more attractive to people on welfare. It sounds really good. But on net, it's ambiguous to bad for labor supply. So cutting the benefit reduction rate is not a source of strengthening labor supply incentives for those on welfare. OK. Back in the day, and by back in the day, I often mean the 80s, uh, it used to be true that you could not get Medicaid benefits in some states unless you were receiving cash welfare. That's how, you know, when you go to the, when you go to the state benefits office, they would say, well, if you're on welfare, you also get free medical, insur medical, care through me medical insurance through Medicaid. Right? It used to be linked that you had to be on cash welfare in order to get Medicaid. So in other words, suppose, let's go back to our, let's go back to our, our new program, our newfangled program with a 75% uh, cent reduction rate, the 75% reduction rate. That's our red line, right? Suppose in addition, if you were on TANF, if you were on welfare, you got free Medicaid, right? You, but you only got Medicaid if you stayed on welfare. Suppose you were thinking, you know, you were working such that you were earning 11,000, or let's say you were earning $12,000, right? Which is as much as you can possibly earn and still be on welfare. Let's say it's $11,999. So at $11,999 of income, your boss offers you an extra shift. You think about working that shift. If there was no Medicaid, you know your consumption set would be bigger. You'd be earning more, right? But if you lose your Medicaid benefits, it's like you fall off from the top of that green line, right? You fall from all the way up there, right, to down here. Because for working one extra shift, working one more hour, sure, you're getting a little additional cash income. You can consume more but you're losing this medical benefit that you valued at maybe $3,000. So the tax rate on that additional hour of labor, where you go from, let's say, $11,999 to $12,009, has an enormous tax rate, because you're losing $3,000 in benefits for that hour. Sure, you're earning $10 more in income. You're losing $3,000 in benefits. That's, a very, that's, a, that's not a smart decision, right? Because from trying to have a slightly higher income, to maybe you know, feed and clothe your kids, you're going to lose access to medical care. And this was sort of, you know, administratively it makes sense. Oh, we have benefits for poor people, so if you're really poor, you can get all these benefits, right? You're going to get cash welfare, you're going to get Medicaid, you're going to get food stamps, you get the laundry list. But by linking all these programs together, what we do is we create what, what is known as notches. That dive from the top of the green line down to the blue line is a notch. Does it ever make sense to be located in that part of the blue line? No, because you're better off not working, enjoying a little more leisure, and keeping your medical benefits. So linking these programs has a negative effect on labor supply where the notch is. So what if we delinked this program? What if we said you got to keep your Medicaid through this whole interval? Let's just pretend. Then we'd be in the world of the, of the red and blue budget constraint, right? If Medicaid was not related to your labor supply decision somehow. 
So what we did for people is we started sort of, instead of having this big notch, we created a slope. So it looked more like a parallel shift of the red line, where your Medicaid benefit instead of disappearing altogether, because what creates the dive, the vertical line, on the, the green vertical line, is the fact that you're either getting full Medicaid benefits or you're completely not getting them, right? What if we phased them out? That would create a, lot, a, a slope, right? There'd be a, a slope and less of a notch. It'd be a slope like this to the blue line. And that was, that's what the idea behind delinking additional benefits from welfare recipients is about. So the discontinuous loss of the other benefits, in this case, Medicaid, but it could also be school lunches. And it used to be school lunches in some cases. It was often housing, uh, public housing access. So delinking those additional benefits removes that discontinuous loss, right? It removes that notch. Evidence suggests that the decoupling of welfare and Medicaid in the 1980s led to, led to modest decreases in the welfare roles. There were people who were ready to leave welfare, but the loss of medical care access led them to stay on the program. OK, targeting. So earnings are a function. So when we think about someone who is low income, right? if we look at a category of people who are low income, some of the folks who are low income are low ability in some sense. They lack the skills to earn sufficient income. They're low ability. But there could also be in that same group people who are skilled, high ability, but lazy. right? They just don't want to work. They love leisure. They, they do not enjoy working. So there's two groups of low-income people, we could think. There are those who, have the, who lack the capacity to make moderate amounts of income, to be middle income, and those who choose not to, even though they potentially could. In general, we want to target benefits to those who are low ability, who can't earn sufficient income to get by, and exclude those who are just lazy. Right? That's the idea of targeting welfare benefits. But there's no way to tell them apart. Right? No one shows up and tells you, I'm the lazy, I'm the lazy type. Right? When, you, when people apply for benefits, everyone sort of looks the same. So we need a way to sort them out. Right? We need targeting mechanisms. So an ideal target would be something that's related to the fact that you have a low earnings capacity. But it's also something that you can't change. And it's easy to verify. Right? If the target was wearing a blue shirt, that would be a bad target. Right? Because I could do that tomorrow. Anyone could do that tomorrow. If that was the target, that would be terrible. We need something that's actually, and plus, that's not related to being low, a low earnings capacity person. That's nothing to do with your earnings ability, right? So we want something that actually is related to the fact that you, it's very hard for you to earn enough income, and it's not easily changeable, and we can verify it easily. OK. So what is one that I said we typically use? What, oh, what, what, who makes up a lot of welfare recipients? Single moms. So women with children who are not married make up a lot of welfare recipients. Is that a good target? It seems to be kind of what we tend to use, right? It's not about being female. It's about being alone, a sole earner that has children. And the structure of those households are typically single mothers. So that's how, like, we kind of seem to be using that as a target. Is that a good one? Well, think about criterion one. Criterion one, remember, is, is it related to having a low earnings capacity? Typically, yes. Single women with children tend to have low wages. Um, they tend to be poor, but it's not just the fact that you know often a single woman with children has had children before they finish their education, so their skills are weaker. But it's not just the fact that they have weaker skills, it's the fact that they actually have these children. Children make the returns to working lower because you have to pay for care for those children, right? So if you're earning $10 an hour, but the the very fact that you're outside of the home and working requires you to spend $7 an hour on childcare, it's very hard for you to earn enough net income right, to get by. The children are costly. They make labor, they make working very expensive for you. So single women with children tend to actually be poor, and they tend to have a low ability to earn sufficient amounts of income, partly just because of the kids themselves. So according to criterion one, it actually looks pretty good. These people are sort of have trouble making enough income to get by. Criteria two, remember, is it has to be a target that's unchangeable and pretty easy to verify. Okay, having kids, pretty easy to verify, right? I mean, it's not super, I mean, there's some chicanery, right? There's some shenanigans that like, people are claiming kids that don't always live with them, et cetera. But by and large, the existence of children is decently easy to verify. You require social security numbers, you make sure no one's uh, double counting kids, you can do it. But is it an unchangeable state? Once you have them, sure, it's kind of unchangeable, right? They're with you. But is it entirely immutable? 
one can go from being a single woman without children to being a single woman with children, right? Or a single man without children, or single ma to a single man with children. That's a changeable state, right? Changes every day. And there was a lot of concern at some point about the fact that welfare benefits, are th th the fact that we target welfare benefits at women with children might lead some women to have children. That there's a fertility response that be, that, you know, the, the availability of cash assistance makes childbearing more attractive. There's a lot of concern about this. But we, but you know, it's, you know, things that, that attract a lot of political and policy attention eventually attract economist attention. And there were a lot of studies about this. And so, well, first let's talk about time series evidence. I mean, go ahead and squint at me. You know, it's not good evidence, but let's start with it. So we know that over the, few, the past few decades, I'll say the past decade and a half, welfare benefits have declined. What we pay out in welfare benefits has gone down on a per capita level and aggregate too. But we know that single motherhood has risen over this time. So the trends don't seem to be lining up. Of course, that's time series evidence, and that's not good evidence, right? Because lots of stuff could be changing that's affecting both of these things, right? Uh, we could be paying a less out in benefits because, you know, we have a weaker taste for sort of redistribution and child um, un, uh, out of wedlock childbearing may be going up or single motherhood may be going up for other reasons. The economy is structured in a different way, which leads us to pay out less benefits and for more women to have children. Um, so yeah, so that's not good evidence. So what we need is quasi-experiments. So there were a lot of state changes in the structure of welfare benefits, which provided a good way to look at whether or not there was a fertility impact, whether when benefits got cut, people had fewer children, or when benefits were more generous, if they had more children. And there's no real uh, discernible effect. There's no effect on motherhood um, from welfare benefits changing. I mean, I know on one level that's unsurprising. The idea that welfare is leading people to have children seems, you know, like a big, a big, a big change in lifestyle based on TANF. But we're not talking about someone who never wanted children having children to get on welfare, right? We're not talking about dramatic, we're talking about on the margin. And it was, potentially possible that someone on the margin of having one kid or two kids might see cash assistance as something that makes having that additional child easier and would have it, right? But what, for, for you know, whatever frictions there are in fertility decisions, it's, it doesn't seem like TANF is driving them. There's no discernible effect of more generous cash welfare on single motherhood. So today, single mothers still remain a target of the US, welfare, of the US cash welfare system. Okay. So now, number five, other ways to reduce moral hazard. Ordeal mechanisms. Ordeal mechanisms are features of welfare programs that make them unattractive to all but the least able in the population. So we're trying to get people to reveal their type, whether they're low ability or not, by making it kind of a pain to get benefits is the idea. Self-revealing. You're going to tell me your type because of what I'm going to make you go through to get the benefits. So examples of this stuff is long lines. That there's no in and out of the cash welfare, uh, in and out of the welfare office. You're going to go down there, it's going to take two and a half hours, it's going to be a pain in the neck. People who are high ability don't find that to be worth their time, right? Right, so long lines. You could have training or work requirements that in order to get these cash benefits, you have to attend sort of training workshops that build uh, that help a person of very low skill attain moderate skill, right? This could be something like, uh, you know, training to help someone work in a call center, right? Or training to help someone learn basic computer skills. If you're, mo if you're high ability, this is extremely annoying to you, right? It just, to, have to have to go learn how to answer the phone and do something, you know, very basic is really a pain for you. Well, for someone who actually is low skill, they might actually value it, right? That they, they're building the basic skills that would help them have a job, right? They would actually, they could very likely positively value the training program. Well, anyone with a skill level above that probably does not value it, right? So that's an ordeal mechanism. You can also offer only in-kind benefits, right? If housing vouchers were a simple $1,000 voucher you could take anywhere, right, including your high-rise and health kitchen, you know, someone who was unemployed temporarily, somehow could, who could somehow claim to be low income right then, no matter what their, you know, other, they could somehow claim it, it would be more attractive to everyone, right, if it was a check. But if you make it in kind, if it's access to what is frankly low quality public housing, right, projects, that makes it only attractive to those who have no other options. 
Um, Section 8 vouchers have limitations on them, right? You can only use them in certain kinds of neighborhoods. And so that makes them less attractive to people who are of higher ability. And then finally, um, there's stigma, right? There's a stigma that's societal to being able but accepting assistance. And while, you know, to encourage take up, government and those who are in the business of providing public services want to reduce the stigma of take up among those who are sort of low ability and low income. Encouraging stigma of those who are of high ability and trying to take up is a, it would be a, a helpful way to have an ordeal mechanism, right? That to make it sort of embarrassing if you're talented, you shouldn't be wasting your talents in using, in using assistance programs, is the idea. Stigma is something that, you know, public policy to, to affect stigma is very hard. Right? That's ineffective. That's sort of what culture does on its own. Do you have a question? Yeah. So you raise a good point. Like the DMV is a pain in the neck, not because they're trying to target the DMV to some group of people, right? Um, not always, but there are benefits to it. Like, so yes, I think the welfare office is understaffed, not maybe by design, but by neglect, right? But it does have this added benefit you could think of it as. Or you, you know, the training programs might be initially motivated to help people build skills. It has this other effect. So yeah, I think a lot of this is not by design. But you could imagine designing one that worked like this. You could also imagine you know, that the DMV is a pain, right? So suppose you wanted to charge people 30 bucks to do it online. It would be a way to sort of, ha you know, making going in person a pain versus paying, right? It would be a targeting mechanism too. Question in the back and a question up front. Um, you mentioned the colors and the, um, some of the World Bank poverty alleviation projects. And, uh, mm -hmm. I think they sort of reckon there's long lines in those sections of the for Need. Yeah, because part of it is, you know, if, um, like in a developing country, if you're able-bodied and actually able to say farm, right, to work or to, to provide uh, labor, the six hours you have to wait to get cornmeal, you might have a better use of that time actually just working, right? If you could work at uh, even a moderate job, you might earn more than the cornmeal is worth. So you really want to, you know, that exactly, that's a great example, is that um, these are used more, more prevalently in developing countries, and especially by, frankly, by institutions operating in developing countries. Yes. Was there another question up front? Yeah, well, Lucas. In the case of something like public, public housing, mm -hmm. the political will to make it higher quality, I think, is a reflection of um, a, an ordeal mechanism and making it undesirable. To make people want to not use it. Yeah. Right. That's an interesting point. Sort of maybe maybe some of the, some of the stuff came about for various reasons, but the inability to change it, the, or the lack of interest in changing it, might have to do with sort of targeting. That's a good point. Yeah, Susan. Uh, so, but some of this stuff is actually changing. For example, like it's easier to apply for Medicaid. Than Absolutely. Or, f yeah, or food stamps are no longer, you, you know, what's, you, know, you have to go in person. Also, I mean, when you're actually using food stamps, right, it used to be a lot more, you know, there was a lot more stigma attached to actually taking out something that looked different than what non-food stamp folks were using to pay for their groceries, right? And now, you know, you, you use a card, a debit card, and it looks a lot more like, it. so this is about, I think, encouraging take up among some groups. And plus, it's gotten cheaper, right? Everything's, everything's digitized. It's easier to do. Lucas, you have a point? Well, I was going to say that that's the, the states, where states control the role, mm -hmm. but the money comes from the federal government. Well, that's a very good point. The states, political economy here, yeah. States have a real incentive to get people on the rolls because it increases the amount of federal money flowing in. Yeah, versus other types of, versus other uh, state-based supports. That's a very good point. Daniel. government. So this stuff is all going to be super related to next week's lecture, which is state and local public finance. And yeah, because I mean, there's pocket, I'm, glad, I'm glad we actually went on this, on this uh, we went down this road, because it's, it's exactly what we'll talk about next week, partly, partly. But yeah, very good point. Yeah, when, there's a, there's a, you know, when the federal government is kicking in every dollar, states have plenty of incentive to get you every benefit you can get for your own welfare and also because it's less, um, less of a, a burden on their state programs too. Other questions or other points? <coughs> awesome. Sorry, where are we at the right? So the last thing we can try to do, sorry, I feel like this lecture is ambiguously long. It'll end soon. Um, I'm sorry about this. Uh, so the last thing we can do is actually help people have better outside options, to make their options outside of welfare better. So increase the effective wage is one thing we can do. One of the things we try to do is training, build people's skills so that instead of having a job that pays them $10 an hour, 
they have a job that pays them $15 an hour. You could think of that as changing the budget constraint, right? We're going to make it steeper. We're going to make it steeper. Hint for the future. I think this is a really interesting thing to model using budget constraints. OK, so you could, you, so, you know, people suggest, so evidence suggests that, you know, having the EITC in place encourages people to enter the labor force. So if we can get folks who are going to enter the labor force because of the EITC also trained to have better work skills, we could really make their lives much better, right? Because they're going to enter the labor force, and maybe they could enter the labor force at a better job than they otherwise could be at. There's a mixed evidence on training, right? A lot of folks think training doesn't work very well. The way we've done it previously it didn't always work very well because it was kind of a hodgepodge of some effective programs and ineffective programs. But there is some evidence that some of them do work. And it's sort of, I think of it a bit like, like uh, education reform, where if we try a lot of stuff, some of it will work, some of it won't work, and the game is to figure out what does work and see how, how much we can expand those types of efforts. Um, we can also help women sort of find work, that, uh, find work more attractive by subsidizing childcare. Like we said, you know, your net wage is $2.50 if you have to pay $7.50 in child care for every, every, every hour you work where you only earn $10 an hour. So one thing we can do is increase your pre-tax wage. So take it from 10 to 15, or we can reduce the cost of child care to you. That makes work more attractive to you as well. Because in some ways, you can think of child care costs as just a tax. Right? It's an additional tax on women with children working. The last thing we can do is increase child support. There's been real uh, efforts at the state level to track down fathers who are not paying child support and make them pay child support, sometimes to the garnishing of wages. There's been some efforts to actually get it right at the paycheck source. And what that does is it makes non-welfare income sources more available to people, right? It makes welfare less attractive because there's other income. There's other income coming in. So yeah, enforcing the obligations of fathers of children whose mothers are on welfare. There's a real, real effort to do this. Oh my god. So yeah, sorry, I forgot the third part of this. We'll, we'll finish quickly, don't worry. I mean, I know, you, I know you have other places to be. If you have to go, it's not rude at all, so please go ahead. Um, okay, so measurement of poverty. So the US federal poverty rate is an absolute measure. It's a number of dollars. It was calculated, there's a story about Molly Orshansky, you can read about it in Gruber. Um, she figured that rent, or sorry, she figured that food made up one third of a family budget. So she figured out what it cost to feed a family multiplied by three. That's roughly where the federal poverty line comes from. So today in 2012, a family of four, for a family of four, the federal poverty line is roughly $23,000. For a family of two, it's about $15,000. So let's take a look at you know, the poverty rates of number of people in poverty from about nine, from, for over a, roughly a 50 year period. So the poverty rate came down a lot in the 60s, right? This is the Great Society programs kicking in and bringing down poverty. It's been kind of, you know, it, it ebbs and flows, but it's roughly, you know, in the same range. But we see that, you know, with a poverty rate that's roughly, you know, flat, the number of people in poverty has grown because population has risen, right? And there are ebbs and flows in that as well. So today, um, I mean, I, I'm an economist and I sometimes forget the numbers. And so, you know, it is, it is a real thing. It's uh, 46 million people live in poverty today, right? And this is, you know, as we talked about just now, this isn't, you know, they, we're talking about real poverty. $23,000 of income for a family of four is not a lot of means, right? So, so poverty in America is a real thing. It's not a rare thing at all. Um, we talked about earlier that Social Security did a lot to combat poverty among the elderly, and that it did. And so, you know, back in the day, you know, or in this period, the face of poverty was often an old person, right? An, el an elderly person whose savings for retirement was insufficient. Today, it's actually a kid. The vast majority of people, the, not the majority, the, the plurality of people in poverty are children. It's young children. Okay. So I'm actually going to skip these slides. This idea of reading, the sneeding or smeeting reading, it's about sort of um, who is poor in different countries. He gives you a very good run through of this stuff, so you can turn to that. Do read the article. It's interesting. I think it's interesting. Um, this actually, so I want to point out one thing. I think this is interesting. That I think a lot of times people think of the US as the country with the highest poverty rates. It's actually the UK. And you know, if you compare it, so if you use our poverty standard and compare across countries, the UK is, you know, I, didn't, I actually did not realize this until I read this article, that there are a lot of folks in Great Britain who live in pretty, pretty serious poverty. And um, I actually, I mean, I've not spent time really outside of London when I go to the UK, so really I don't have a good, uh, comparison to make, honestly, but I, always, I, I do feel like commodity prices are generally higher in the UK. The cost of living is higher. And so our poverty line in, in that country may actually be 
a, a lower level standard of living. Although I don't know exactly where the folks who are falling under this line live, but it could actually be worse in some of these countries. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this stuff. You guys can go through it on your own. We're gonna go with the US problems with the US poverty line. How, I said it's one line, right, across the whole country. It's a federal line. And it uses the cost of food and multiplies by three. So things have changed in America since Molly Orshansky did her calculation. So back in the day she made her calculations, food made up, let's say, roughly a third of what the average family was spending on stuff. Due to the rising cost of housing and medical care, food only makes up 16% of the average family's budget. So using food and multiplying by three is probably not a great measure anymore. There are very large regional differences in the cost of living, and one federal poverty line does not sort of reflect that. We also only count federal, I mean, we only count cash income. We determine how much income someone has relative to the poverty line. So it doesn't include, first of all, taxes, you know, and uh, the working poor pay, payroll taxes, but it also doesn't count the EITC. People might be getting checks back. It doesn't count in-kind transfers. So if one family has Medicaid eligibility and the other doesn't, they're not described as differently poor when you compare their income to the federal poverty level. So other efforts to sort of um, uh, alleviate poverty are not reflected, like the making work pay tax credit that came in a few years ago, the child tax credit, food stamps, i.e. SNAP benefits, they have no effect on the poverty rate. So as we expand these sources of support for poor families, we're not gonna change the poverty rate as calculated by those, by those tables. And this is an absolute measure, right? We said that you're poor if you have less than $23,000 in income. We've talked about how there's been changes in income inequality and income growth, wage growth. An absolute level is gonna tell us, you know, do you have enough to get by and buy this list of things? If the rest of society's consumption bundle is changing dramatically over this period of time, consuming the same bundle of goods may put you further and further behind the median family, right? So this, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, whether you're using a box TV or a flat screen TV, this may seem silly, right? But if you're talking about the quality of food in some sense, or the quality of, of products that you consume, the fact that we're keeping the poverty level fixed while the rest of society gets richer, what we call poor today, relative to the median family, will be very different than what we call poor 50 years from now, relative to the median family in 50 years, right? Because the median family is getting richer and richer, and where we draw the poverty line is relatively the same, in terms of absolute consumption bundle. Um, yes, question. Exactly, exactly, exactly. This meeting article has, an, it has a table like that, yeah. 50% of median income or something like that would be a relative measure. Okay, so there, you know, this is not new. There's even a West Wing about this too. <laughs> um, uh, and I actually think they talk about Molly Roshansky. So this is not a new problem, but you know, efforts to make the federal poverty line more accurate inevitably will lead to there being more people deemed poor. That's not something every administration wants to claim credit for, right? Under my administration, 30 million additional Americans were deemed poor, right? That's, it might be a more accurate measure, but it's not always a thing you want to do, right? But there have been some efforts to come up with an alternative measure of poverty. So we have our official federal poverty measure in this column, and we have what the Census Bureau has deemed the supplemental poverty measure, which is a little different. So how do they differ? Well, what unit over which do we determine whether or not you're poor? So the federal poverty measure, the official poverty measure, uses families and unrelated individuals, okay? The supplemental measure is basically address-based. Anyone who lives at the same address is the unit over which we determine income and poverty, and poverty level. So this could be co-residents and unrelated children who are cared for by the family, such as foster children, or any cohabitors and their children. So you know, uh, lower income families are more likely to have multiple families in the unit in the address, in the physical address, and so the, the supplemental measure takes better account of that. What is the threshold? It's the inflation adjusted minimum cost of a food diet in 1963 is the federal official measure. That's a great face, yeah. That's how you're like, what? That's ridiculous. Yeah. That, I mean, yes, that's what we use for the official federal poverty measure. The supplemental measure uses something more sophisticated. It looks at expenditures on food, clothing, shelter, and, uti and utilities, the F at FCSUs, and it looks at what the 33rd percentile of spending each of those categories is across consumer units with two children, and then it multiplies by 
These are sort of, this is, you know, this was done by a team of people who are tasked with doing this as well as they can. This is what they determined. What this accounts for is changes over time what people spend on these goods, right? If food is getting cheaper and housing is getting more expensive, this will be reflected here. What are the threshold adjustments? So the federal poverty line varies by family size. Composition, if you have old people or children, it varies a little bit. The 23,000, 15,000 I gave you were averages. Um, so it varies a little bit by, by composition and the age of the head of the household. The supplemental measure makes geographic adjustments. It reflects differences in cost of living across regions, especially for housing costs. And it also uses basically a three-parameter scale to figure out equivalence across family size and composition. Here, there's really just one adjustment, one parameter. It's slightly more sensitive. Don't worry about the, what the parameters are. Just think it's more sensitive. It's more carefully done. Updating thresholds. We just take the 1963 threshold and inflate for inflation when it comes to the official poverty measure. Here, we use a five-year moving average, average of spending on those categories, right? A little more careful, a little bit more uh, time, time, overtime variation will be incorporated into the supplemental measure. And what is the resource measure? How do we decide whether or not you're poor? We just look at gross before tax cash income over here. We don't talk about benefits. We don't count taxes. We don't count um, transfers. Over here, we use whatever cash income you're getting plus any in-kind benefits you're eligible for. To, that, that would actually go to your FCSU needs, less any taxes, or plus any tax credits you're getting, minus any work expenses. So if you have expenses to commute to your job, you know, uh, for example, a subway pass in New York is a very expensive thing for a low-income family. That would be deducted. And any out-of-pocket medical expenses is what's used over here. So this is a supplemental measure. Um, the Census Bureau came up with it. So what effects do these have? So this is the traditional, this is the alternative. When it comes to the poverty rate, the alternative measure is lower, actually, because it counts a lot of these programs that have been put in place that help families um, in poverty. When it looks at age, the alternative program shows a lower poverty rate for children than the federal poverty line, because a lot of benefits we have in place today are targeted to children rather than adults, right, rather than adults. When it comes to race, the alternative rate is lower for blacks, but it doesn't affect the rate for Hispanics very much. We talked before about how there are really different um, utilization differences across racial and ethnic groups. Hispanics, for whatever reason, have a lower take-up rate on benefit programs. And so including all these benefits, which the federal poverty rate doesn't include, right, doesn't affect Hispanic poverty rates as much. When it comes to regions, of course, who's going to look poorer with the alternative measure? Folks where housing costs and other costs are much higher, i.e. the Northeast. Whereas the Northeast actually is really similar. Um, Oh, the South. The South, you look less poor because housing costs are much lower in the South. Um, and then areas, uh, poverty rates in the metro areas are going to be very similar. Rural poverty is going to be much lower because of cost of living differences. Okay, so that's it. That's it. You're free. Okay.